Oh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when it finds you. Uh, just a reminder, the book, But Hey, What Do I Know, is available at Amazon and Born to Noble, or directly from me at myronjones at gmail.com, M-Y-R-A-N-J-O-N-E-S at gmail.com. And today's video, I want to talk about a subject. Uh, many of us in this society has some degree of uh, historical context on, and that's slavery. And I guess I could call this slavery 21st century style. Because whether you believe it or not, that's exactly what we're dealing with. And 2 Timothy 1 and 7, it says that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of love, power, and wise discretion. And right now, a lot of people seem to be lacking that wise discretion. And as I've stated before, we have made government our God. And look at what our God has given us. Our God has given us no power, no control, illogical thinking, and a huge helping of fear. Everything that that scripture I just read, it's in total opposition to that. And so looking at this century, this 21st century, look at how it started. We got 9-11. And then we were conditioned to live in fear of terrorists. And because of this, look at how we have to travel through airports now and train stations and other different modes as well. You know, they even have checkpoints depending on where you're traveling in the country by vehicle. And then we have to go through these checkpoints at airports. And we're basically having to strip down to walk through metal detectors. And then you take all your metal objects out of your pocket, take all your jewelry off, take your belt off, take your shoes off. I mean, it's a total invasion of privacy, you know, which in essence violates the Fourth Amendment. But in the name of safety, we comply. And then the airports around the world upgraded and put radiation scanners in place. And they said, if you don't want your body zapped with the radiation, you can opt out and volunteer to be felt up and groped by strangers, total strangers. And even babies and the elderly have to submit to this draconian uh, tactic. They're working overtime to force us to have a vaccination passport before we can travel. Well, internationally uh, right now, but you better believe if they're working on it internationally, they're not far behind working on it domestically either. Is that freedom? Now, isn't it amazing that anytime you need to get x-rays, you're always covered with a shield that protects you from the radiation? But it has now been deemed perfectly normal to walk through a machine that zaps you with no protection at all. They have actually told us that the amount of radiation emitted does no harm. Aren't these the same folks who told us cigarettes were safe? Aren't these the same folks that told us asbestos was safe? We can't leave the country today already without a passport. But... Did you even realize that passports were not necessary to leave and travel outside the country before 1941? Over 70 cities around this country have made feeding the homeless illegal. In May of 2019, down here in Houston, where I live, the mayor came out and said he would assess a fine up to $2,000 for feeding the homeless without permission from the government, the local government. And they said sometimes on uh, pro abandoned properties, if you didn't get 
permission from the owner of the abandoned property, you could also be fined, even though the owner of the abandoned property abandoned the property. I mean, they when they abandon the property, they don't have any, <laughs> um, what's the word I want? They don't have any plans on coming back to that abandoned property anyway. So it's, it's a revenue generator for the city. And, you know, they also said down here, they wanted to make sure the homeless people were being fed nourishing foods. Now, do you think city officials, well, any official for that matter, believe that? Because if they actually believed in helping the homeless, why do we have any homeless? Why do we have homeless that need to be fed at all if the city actually cared about them? And you know the law has to be bad when the Democratic Socialists, the Republican Party, Muslims, atheists, Christians, and the Democratic Party all agree to stand against it. I mean, it has to be real bad because none of these groups agree on anything. And in many cities and states around the country, you cannot even collect rainwater. When did the government get ownership of the rain? I mean, in the past, you didn't even need a license to fish, hunt, start a business, remodel your own home, build, build your own home, uh, own a home. I mean, are you familiar with the feudal system? Have you ever studied the feudal system? That's F-E-U-D-A-L. Have you ever studied feudalism? And that's where the state allows you to live on a piece of land as long as you agree to be in servitude to the king, lord, or nobility. Do you realize that your attorneys and judges are considered nobility? What are most of your politicians, what are their professions in? Law. Every one of your judges has to be a lawyer. And lawyers and judges are considered nobility. That's why the government thinks they're gods. But in that type of system, you are called a peasant or a serf or villain and it it's almost it almost looks like the word villain but it's v-i i mean v-i-l-l-e-i-n and they, they all mean the same thing in exchange for using the land you actually have to pay taxes to the king the lord or nobility does that sound familiar whenever they want it you had to be in servitude and service the king whenever he wanted, especially if they needed you for the military. Does that sound familiar? And you were never allowed to leave the estate, period. You had no rights. And you had to ask permission before you get married. And all of them were poor. And some of you may say you aren't poor. Well, it's all relative. How long would you be able to survive at your current rate of living if you didn't have an income coming in? Would you be able to make it three months? I mean, based on what transpired after March 13th of this year, when we went in full draconian lockdown, and based on people not being able to feed themselves and take care of their bills after a month, I'm stretching, asking three months. But some of you are a lot better off. So would you be able to make it three months, six months, a year longer? And I mean, if you have an idea of how long you can actually survive and it's not that long, you're poor. Karl Marx was actually asked what was the difference between a slave and a proletariat. And this is actually what he said. Because I want to read this because I want to make sure I get it word for word. The slave is sold once and for all. The proletarian has to sell himself by the day and by the hour. The slave is the property of one master and for that very reason has a guaranteed subsistence, however wretched it may be. The 
proletarian is, so to speak, the slave of the entire bourgeois class, not of one master, and therefore has no guaranteed subsistence, since nobody buys his labor if he does not need it. The slave is a counter to thing and not a member of civil society. The proletarian is recognized as a person, as a member of civil society. The slave may therefore have a better subsistence than a proletarian, but the latter stands at a higher stage of development. The slave frees himself by becoming a proletarian, abolishing from the totality of property relationships only the relationship of slavery. Now, what does that sound like to you? What does proletariat sound like to you? Sounds like employee. I mean, you basically, as an employee, we sell our time to somebody, to different masters. And how can I say that? Because if we get dissatisfied with one master, we go and fill out resumes and send to several other potential masters so we can sell our time to them. Am I putting that down? Not at all. I'm just telling you, we think this society is advanced and we're still operating under the same feudalist system that has been in place for at least five, six, seven, eight hundred years or more. See, we don't understand this stuff because we're so advanced now. So based on what Marx described, what's the difference in being an employee and a member of a proletariat? And many of you get mad, you get upset because somebody else is trying to mentally free you. Are you free? Well, I'm going to keep talking. And as I'm talking and you listen to what I'm saying, just keep playing that question over in your mind. Are you free? We have to get licenses to use a vehicle that we pay for in a private transaction. We have to get a license to cut hair. I mean, cut hair? You need a license to cut hair? I mean, really? I mean, my stepdad cut my hair. You know, I, in the beginning, I was going to Miss Bale, a female barber. And then after a while, he just got tired of paying and he started cutting my hair. And so he didn't need a license. But you need a piece of paper that says you can cut or style hair. You need a license to own guns. You need a license to sell products. You need a license to garden and grow food on your own property. As a matter of fact, look at the difference in the thought process. As a matter of fact, during World War II, the government actually encouraged the people to start something they call victory gardens. So the people could take care of themselves. Before 1930, only 24 states required you to have a driver's license. And only 15 of those states required you to take a test. How are we looking today? We need permission to get married. We need government permission to get married, but you can shack up for free. I mean, is that not crazy? And their justification is that it is in order to protect your assets upon death. You don't need protection from your heirs. You need protection from the state. Where did estate death and or inheritance tax come from? I mean, your family can fight amongst themselves about what you left over, but the state come in and say, hey, I was come off the top first. I mean, does that not bother you? So you don't need protection from your descendants. You need protection from the government. Remember how it used to be illegal for a black and white person to get married and the government said it was not allowed? No. Everybody can get married as long as you pay the government that tax. I mean, marriage certificate processing fee. If there's a pond or lake that you like to fish at, you have to get government permission to catch fish that are free that inhabit that waterway. You cannot go out and just hunt deer without government approval. And then you are limited to how many deer you can hunt and kill. According to the government, if you operate a small business, you are not essential. 
Isn't it amazing that not one large corporation has been influenced in the negative by the lockdowns? As a matter of fact, they exceeded financial projections by April of this year. They exceeded projections, but small businesses have been destroyed in many cases because of what happened. Do you even know what a monopoly is? And I'm not talking about the game. I mean, if you study the game, the game is actually telling you what the Federal Reserve System is. But we playing the game in the name of entertainment and trying to beat the people we playing who can own the most greenhouses and red hotels. But we're not understanding that it's a game based on fiat currency, which is what the Federal Reserve System is, the system of, of fiat currency. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm talking about freedom and slavery. But you understand how you've been enslaved. Now, now you're a debt slave. And I'm going to talk some more and show you how you more than a debt slave. You just don't realize it. But monopoly. Do you know how to even recognize a monopoly? when it's being built. In, in essence, we are actually dealing with an oligarchy, which is a structure where a small group of people may be distinguished by nobility, once again, wealth, education, corporate, religious, political, or military control. I mean, I've been on the religious and political control for, for several videos now. I was on nobility. I, I just called them lawyers or legislators in the last video. So still in the, we're still dealing with the same people, whether you believe it or not. But in reality, I think we're dealing more with of a plutocracy. And think about it. Right now, we have to get permission to leave our homes. I mean, it, it's loosely like that now, but in essence, when they tell you, you know, you can't go this place, you can't go to, you have to get permission to leave. And the government has deemed what they feel are essential businesses, except when it comes to themselves and their families. We basically have to get permission to congregate. We have to get a permit to protest or assemble in large crowds. And then we're told to snitch on those who are not following the master's orders. Homeowners associations. They tell you what color your house can be. They tell you what color you can paint your own house that you paid for. You just spent $150,000, dollars $500,000 for a house. And, they, and you got some people come telling you what color you can paint what you bought. If they tell you if you can have a carport at your house. And yada, yada, yada. Hope they, they, they just overstep their boundaries too. But in some respects, they are good. I will give them that. I'm still looking for that. I mean, like, keep your neighbors from parking the cars on the grass and bring it down the value and the aesthetics of the community. I'm all with that. But outside of that, I don't really see any value from them. You know, it's just another way to give somebody a position of power to make them feel good. So in most respects, they're nothing but little government trolls themselves. We cannot take drugs unless we get written permission from a doctor who has been authorized by the government officials. Now, that's unless you like to smoke a little crack, snort a little cocaine, do your little heroin or, or some opium. And, you know, then that becomes cool because you don't need permission from, well, Never mind. <laughs> but 40% of workers today need some type of government license or permit just to do the job where back in 1954, only about 5% of the workers needed one. Today, today you need a license to be a massage therapist. I mean, you're rubbing a sore body that needs some pain relief. I mean, I was an athlete and, you know, depending on things you get hurt in practice, a sore muscle, whatever, you would go in and see a trainer. And in most cases, that trainer didn't have to be licensed. They were just somebody that understood human anatomy and knew where the pain was. They could touch you in certain spots and know, okay, this is, okay, we're going to work on this area. 
but now a massage therapist is doing basically the same thing, but need a license. And I'm pretty sure athletic trainers need licenses today. That's why they have a whole job industry with that as well. You need a license to sell and cut flowers as a florist. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? Am I the only one who thinks there's something wrong with that? Lawmakers are always seeking to add revenue to the government account, so they keep finding new ways to tax us. I mean, legitimize us, my bad. Do you realize what licensing jobs and occupations are? It's actually the new form of unions. It's just a way around using the term unions because a lot of companies have outlawed unions in this country. So people are still being locked out of jobs. And once again, it's the industry insiders who are going to lobbyists, who are going to your legislators to make sure they can lock people out of those jobs. So they use the government to do the exact same thing that unions did because unions use the government as well. Y'all love FDR, didn't you? In your industry, if you have to be licensed, you can thank those who came before you that put it in place to lock others out and use the government to accomplish it. And today, unions themselves are about 12% of the workforce. But 40% of jobs now require licensing. Are you free? And according to the Bill of Rights, you know, those things that none of your legislators abide by, and since your gods don't abide by them, you don't want them either until yours get violated. But according to the Bill of Rights, there are certain things the government is not allowed to do. Did you hear me say not allowed? I didn't say they weren't doing it. I said they were not, they're not supposed to be allowed to do it. The Bill of Rights is not conditional, but your legislators have made it so. The government cannot keep you from joining together peacefully with others to express your views. The government cannot keep you from saying what you wish. The government cannot prevent you from complaining about what the government is doing to you. And those are just some of the things they can't do that's put in the First Amendment. And there's nothing in there that says the government can come in and violate it should a certain incident happen. That's what executive orders come in place to do, which are not constitutional. The 24th Amendment says the government cannot limit your rights to just those listed in the Bill of Rights. You know why? Because your rights come from God. They don't come from government. The 10th Amendment says the government cannot claim to possess more power and authority than what the Constitution permits, and all other powers not listed in the Constitution belong to the states or individuals. That's another reason why the federal government, the president, can't come into a state without government, the governor's permission. But many of you wanted Trump to come in and make the Republican governors do what the Democratic governors were doing and shut down everything. But the 10th Amendment prevents something like that from happening, unless you take federal money in a situation such as what we're dealing with. But if you reject federal money, you don't have to allow them in. But even then, the sheriff of your local county is the highest law enforcement officer in that county. So if the president comes in, the sheriff actually has the power to tell the president, get the hell out of town. Now, you didn't know that, did you? But when your legislators violate the Constitution, they pass that thought process on to us as the people. And then the people don't respect the Constitution. So our rights continue to get eroded by people who have sworn on a Bible to defend and protect our rights. So if these people you vote for place their hand on the Bible and lie the whole while, they are not to be trusted under any circumstance. Did you hear me? They are not to be trusted 100% of the time because they are, are liars straight from the pit of hell. When was the last time any person you voted for, whether Republican or Democrat, even mentioned the word constitution? They don't mention it because they have no intention of abiding by it. 
So why would you mention it? Their attorneys, they know what the Constitution says, but they have no intent, they have no intent of abiding by the Constitution. The only time the uh, legislators want to mention the Constitution is when they take their oath or when they want to tell you what's not in it. But they'll never tell you what's in it. But they'll tell you they'll tell you what's not in it when they don't want to abide by it. Oh, the Constitution doesn't say that. Well, tell me what the Constitution says because they know. Or somebody on their staff knows exactly what's in the Constitution. But your lawyers know the Constitution. Trust me on that one. And so it used to be that there were two classes of people who stood in total opposition to one another, and they were the bourgeois class and the proletariats, as, as I mentioned earlier with what uh, Karl Marx described them as. And James Allen wrote a book uh, called As a Man Think It some years and years ago. And I read that book on a regular basis. And James Allen, he didn't call it the bourgeois class and the proletariat class. He actually called them the oppressed and the oppressor. And he said, both of them are cooperators in ignorance. And I'm not going to get into all that. that. That will have to be a whole nother talk one day if I ever feel like getting around to it. But according to Marx, the bourgeois class were the capitalists. And, you know, I have to use that term loosely because those we say built their wealth off of capitalism the wrong way are actually crony capitalists, not true capitalists. There's a, there's a huge difference. And today's crony capitalists have not done away with class differences. They just use different ways to classify us. But if we're not part of their class, all of us are the proletariat. I mean, it is what it is. And the proletariat is a controlled class. And sadly, right today, 33% of people surveyed actually have a favor, uh, favorable view of slavery. I'm sorry, not slavery, socialism. But the same thing, you can do you some research. I have a whole lot of books on that topic, pro and against. And most of them don't know what they're advocating for because most of your college professors are Marxists in their ideology and thought process at practically every college in America, North and South and around the world, even the so-called Christian colleges. And I mean, I'll tell you what, when I was in college, I never fell in line with a lot of their thinking. These folks are so evil in their thinking that they have masterly figured out how to get the proletariat class to fight one another and hate the true capitalists who have done things the right way and building their wealth. So they're now calling it the Great Reset. Well, what are they trying to reset? They are trying to destroy the means for the people at large to provide their own sustenance. In essence, they want to destroy true capitalism while the few continue to live off of crony capitalism, which is slavery. And just so you know, it was not capitalism that built slavery, even though many blacks today will say it was capitalism because they want to say people with capital. Well, in any system, people are the capital. It, what the difference is, is who benefits depending on the system. The slavery system was actually a hybrid system of economics. And I talk about that in my book, but hey, what do I know? But it was a hybrid system of economics that built slavery. In other words, they call it, they don't call it hybrid system. They call it mixed economies. And so it was a mixed economy more closely related to socialism and capitalism. Because in capitalism, a lot more people benefit economically. And under socialism, a select few are the only benefactors of that system. 
And in reality, socialism is actually the true system of affirmative action, which benefits the few. Even what we think of affirmative action today to be, it's really not that. Because under that system as well, that was put in place in the 60s, late 60s, there's still only one group of people that received 90% of the benefits. And the rest of society has to split the remaining 10%. And for the past nine months, all we keep hearing is the new normal. And all that is is the new term for new world order, which is actually the old world order. And the old world order is actually slavery. You got to do your research. What do you think new normal and great, great reset mean? They didn't say reset, they say great reset. Once again, they have used fear tactics to get us to comply. How many people are out of work because of what they did? How many people ended up on unemployment because of what they did? How many people have been on welfare rolls for years? Isn't it amazing that we have people who say, let's cut some of this stuff out so we can allow people to be free and responsible. And the masses, and I have to keep reminding you when I say the word masses, the M is always silent. But the masses come out and vilify the person who wants grown-ups to be responsible and free. Hey, you never heard me say welfare was bad. But welfare was not meant for what it is today. It was meant, supposedly, according to what they said it was supposed to be for, it was for people who experienced temporary setbacks. You know, somebody like maybe a husband and wife divorce and, you know, the wife might have been a homemaker and needs to get on her feet. And, you know, so until she can get on her feet and the child support kicks in, you know, we're going to help her out, help her and the kids out. And why do the kids always get custody? The mother always get custody of the kids in almost 100% of the cases. I'm not saying shit, but and some of these mothers are no good either. But, you know, if she's not running the streets out on crack or something, you know, the system is deeming her a fit human being, even though she's unfit. Because the system has been put in place to destroy the man. And if you destroy the man, you de destroy the family. But, you know, enough of that. I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit, but I'm not going to dwell on that too much. But some people have made welfare a lifestyle and amazingly more and more people are waiting on the next round of stimulus checks to be sent out and are mad because they haven't already come a friend of mine says that when you keep giving children candy it becomes harder and harder to take it away from the child and it's the same way with adults you give them a perceived gift for nothing and they want those freebies to keep coming but my friend was never talking about children. He was always talking about adults. And he said this many years ago. You see, we don't know how long these plans have been in place. And one of the most important functions of education today is the preparation of a skilled labor force for the national economy, not your private life or your private economy, and to ensure the socialization of the younger generation. What do you think social justice is? Can I, can I tell you something? As long as you have evil people in the world, there will never, ever be anything called social justice. In 1934, all of us must be subjected this was said in 1934, all of us must be subjected to a large degree of social control. What do you think they are doing to us right now? They are controlling us socially. Social distancing is actually social isolation. You can't gather with your family because you need to maintain a distance. What is it? It's social control. I have so much stuff, and uh, here's something else I came across while going over some notes that 
I didn't even realize I had these notes so long. I started looking at the dates I actually did the notes, and uh, some of this stuff is I've been had for years. But it says the home, the church, and and the school cannot be effective maintainers of society since the future cannot be predicted. So let me translate that for you. The future they want cannot be predicted because the private institutions may be teaching something that goes against the system ideals. So this is what happened. Everything fits together when you start studying and researching. They came into the churches under LBJ because LBJ got mad because the preachers were, when they had backbone, they were criticizing LBJ publicly and telling people not to vote for him. So LBJ got real sneaky and went into the churches and took control of the churches with the 501c3 status. So now the government was socially controlling the church. A few years later, and not even really a few years later, around that same time. They took control of the home through something called a feminist movement. And you thought it was about women and equality. It had nothing to do with that. And so they destroyed the home. They destroyed the family. And then the school was taken over when they created the Department of Education. Now, all of this was accomplished in about a 15 year period from about 1965 to 1980. But the plans had already been in play since the end of the 19th century, right after slavery of the black Hebrews had ended. See, people who are conditioned under the system thinking have no clue how all this stuff comes together. And I won't do super long videos because I know many folks attention span is not long enough to listen to this one. And I read somewhere not too long ago that the attention span of a human being right now is eight seconds. And that's pretty bad because the same article said the attention span of a goldfish is nine. I mean, but I could do two or three hour long videos from time to time to make a point. But I, I'm going to spare you from having to listen to me talk for that long. There's one guy I subscribed to. He doesn't have a video that is less than two hours long. And when I listen, I listen to the whole thing. But I have to set aside time to do that. And it's normally late at night. You know, like I'm up now, it's like 1.30 in the morning. But, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. Another guy said some years ago that many daily decisions and value judgments now made by the individual will soon be made for him. This statement was made over 70 years ago. President George H.W. Bush said in 1991 that we needed new schools for a new world. I mean, can you see how this stuff has been going on for over a century? In 1905, the Carnegie Foundation started funding socialistic global education projects. And these folks actually said that the challenge to humanity is to adopt new ways of thinking, new ways of acting, new ways of organizing itself in society, in short, new ways of living. And right today, we have been given a new way of thinking, especially toward each other. We've been given an entirely new way of acting toward one another. Have you sneezed or coughed around people recently? Have you noticed the funny looks you get because you did so? You had a natural body function. And because the fear mongering, mongering is so strong, people cut their eyes at you. They roll their eyes and, you know, they want to know why you <laughs> violate their space. Even if you're 10, 15, 20 feet away. We have adopted a new way of living. I mean, really, folks. We're walking around with paper masks on, cloth masks, face masks, face shields, and even fashionable masks. 
I mean, that's become a whole industry, fashionable mask. I don't want a fashionable mask. I don't want a mask at all. We've been given a new way to act among each other. Breathing free and fresh air has become illegal. Some folks are walking around with gloves on. We are so clean now because the government told us you need to wash your hands. I mean, that should have been something you should have been doing anyway. But I mean, many men that listen to this and know I'm not lying. When you, you go to the restroom, you see a lot of men don't wash their hands when they leave the restroom. So they've been shaking hands with other men and women for years with that nasty hand. Now all of a sudden they sanitary. And I mean, over the years, I worked retail for a lot of years. And from time to time, we would take turns on who would have to clean the restroom. The ladies are no better. So we're so clean and sanitary now that we throw the gloves and masks on the ground when we leave out of the establishment for another human being to have to come behind us and clean it up. But we say we're concerned. We're so civilized and we're still nasty. Are you still eating? Now, it doesn't matter how much you wash your hands if the person packing your food is unsanitary. I mean, it's like uh, my high school was on, uh, the health department visited my high school one year and we were on the evening news that night about our unsanitary school kitchen. And when that happened, I watched a lot of people I went to school with, they stopped eating at the cafeteria because they weren't going to go through the line and eat that food until a health department came back and gave the cafeteria a clean bill of health. And I wasn't, I mean, y'all know how the lines are in school, at a school lunch line. You know, you got 25, 30 minutes to eat and you're in line for about 20, 25 minutes. And so I was happy when all the people stopped eating at the cafeteria. I was eating and one of the ladies, I would talk to her all the time. She was an older lady. And she said, boy, you one of the few people that's still eating this cafeteria. And I said, well, I'm just happy to be able to get through the line and get some food. And I'd be able to sit down at the table and enjoy it. And you know, some of my classmates were ridiculing me for eating the food at the cafeteria. But that lady told me something one day. She said, all of these kids have been eating this food before now, she said, we got the bad grade from what happened before now. And all the kids were eating in. She said, the health department is coming back. So, you know, we have to be on top of our game and make sure this kitchen is clean and the conditions are safe. She said, this is actually the perfect time to eat it. And so I actually... Hated when the health department came back and gave them that clean bill of health because not a line for long again. But it made perfect sense. You were doing all these other things when you weren't living in fear because the media and the government didn't tell you to live in fear. Your doctors didn't tell you to live in fear. And so you've been doing all this interacting with one another. And there were much worse things going on, much things on people. You got people walking around, don't even wash their hands out the sitting on the toilet. They got fecal matter on their hands. And I mean, I know that's kind of descriptive, but I'm just telling you, you've been shaking hands and hugging these people for years and now all of a sudden you don't want to touch anybody. Yeah, I'm aggravated. I'm still aggravated. I'm not going to say angry. I'll, I'll, a, a friend told me it's called, uh, I have some righteous indignation. So it doesn't matter how you much you wash your hands if the person packing your food ain't clean. Can you see how all of this has been in play and we have just conformed right to the demands of people who do not care about us? These folks don't care about us, but they condition us to fear one another. See how they work? I'll call for a tow truck to take my car to the dealership, my wife's car to the dealership. And the driver got here about 6.30 in the morning. And when I entered the truck with the guy, he said, man, you don't have to wear this mask if you don't want to. I said, man, I don't care about no mask. He said, whew, thank you. I don't like them either. And he took it off. He said, but I have to wear it. He said, you know, because of what they telling everybody in society. He said, man, I'm so glad 
uh, I'm in a truck with another free thinker. And so, like I said, it's 6.30 in the morning. And so, as, as I saw, you know, some of us remember the video that went viral years ago. And the woman said, ain't nobody got time for that. I don't like talking to people that early in the morning. But, I mean, he was pleasant. He's a, he's a real friendly gentleman. And we talked all the way to the shop. And he said his girlfriend's mom wasn't feeling good, so they took her to the emergency room. And he said before they even checked her out in the emergency room, they actually diagnosed her with the virus. And he said we told them she had not been anywhere and had not had any contact with people, but they kept insisting that she had the virus. And he then said, he said well, once they found out she didn't have insurance, all of a sudden, she didn't have a virus anymore. She was suffering from pneumonia. And that's all it was. She was I mean, pneumonia is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, <laughs> literally or figuratively. But it's nothing to sneeze at. But that's a big difference from diagnosing somebody with something they don't have just because there's financial incentive for you to do so. You get three times the money at the hospital if you send somebody to a respirator that has the virus. I mean... It's about money, increasing theirs and decreasing yours. And he told me, he said, he said, as a tow truck driver, I'm all over the city every day. And I could have driven my wife's car to the dealership, but I wanted to be safe because there was something going on with the brakes. But, you know, I, I pay for AAA, and so, you know, might as well use it. And uh, he said, Mr. Jones, you probably could have drove this vehicle. I said, yeah, I know. I said, but I wasn't. And uh, But he said he's over the city all day, every day. And he doesn't know where these inflated virus numbers are coming from because every testing facility that he's passed by is empty every day. And so when I got out of his truck at the dealership, we actually shook hands instead of giving each other a fist bump. Hey. Take care of your own immune system and stop allowing these folks to control and just dictate every aspect of your life. What did you think was taking place when Obamacare was created? They were telling you they were getting ready to take over your health. Breathe you some fresh air. Love on your family and friends. Hug your family and friends. Isn't it amazing? that the talk all year was virus, the virus, the virus, up until we got close to election time. And all of a sudden the virus magically disappeared. But now that the election is over, the virus numbers are miraculously out of control again. Like Bill Cosby and Alan Poussaint book title said, come on people. Now there's a former congressman from Maryland uh, sixth congressional district. I think his name is John Delaney. John Delaney, and he actually proposed. He was on CNN the other day, and he proposed giving people who volunteer for the vaccine the stimulus checks. And this guy's not even in politics anymore on paper, but he is proposing conditions. He said his exact words were: "We have to create, in my judgment." an incentive for people to really accelerate their thinking about taking the vaccine. To be sure, those who are not comfortable receiving the vaccine would not be forced to do so. If you're still afraid of the vaccine and don't want to take it, that's your right. You won't participate in this program. Did you hear that? He said, if you don't want the vaccine, you ain't getting no money. We better get proactive real fast because Proverbs 22 says a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Can you see the upcoming danger or do you really think things are going back to the way it used to be? And here I come again. These pastors haven't helped to prepare us for anything. They get up on their stages and tell us to tithe, give to their mission program, let God handle everything. Well, what Bible do they read? 
God never said for us to be idle. Why did his word have many different scriptures telling us to prepare if he didn't want us to prepare? Why did the word say foresee the calamity and be ready for it? Our pastors today are doing nothing more than what our slave ancestors were taught by the slave masters. That is, you will get your reward in heaven because God ain't helping you on this side. So, if God had no plans to help us on this side, why did he give us an instruction manual on how to live on this side? How many of your pastors have ever did a message on being prepared and living and foreseeing the impending danger? But the time the message is always on the agenda, aren't they? They tell you to keep giving and giving and giving until it hurts because you cannot give God. Well, if you cannot give God, why you keep begging the people? Let me not even get on that. Now, in all my years of attending church and watching sermons and listening to sermons and ordering sermons on, off of websites online having sent to my house, I have only heard one pastor do a preparedness seminar. He's no longer living. And that seminar was two and a half hours long and he did it right inside his church. I don't want or need feel good messages. I don't care about no pastor and wife appreciation. I don't care what kind of vehicle you drive. What are you doing to properly prepare people in more ways than one? And since these charlatans in the pulpit are not helping us, we need to be proactive. Sadly, they can't teach what they don't know. They only know certain parts of the Bible. They stay away, away from the other stuff because they don't want to tell people what's coming. So they stay away from it. When last time you heard a, a pastor talk about any scripture from Revelation? But they Bible experts, huh? Here's a challenge for you. Where you live, can you name one, just one politician that you voted for who actually cares about you? Just give me one, one name. And then you and I can sit down and we'll review that record together on a phone call or a Zoom call. I guarantee you, you will not be able to name one. And I, I, I'm gonna even go out on a limb and say, tell me, that your pastor cares about you. There are a few, but as a whole, they're no different than politicians. And when you see a pastor become a politician, his soul already gone. Have you ever heard of the civilian inmate labor program? Sure you haven't. And what these are is a facilities around the country that will house those who don't agree with having their rights revoked and their property confiscated or those people who actually believe we're supposed to be living in a free country, or those who are true believers and followers of Christ, or those who refuse to fall in line with a one world government. I mean, hey, do your own research, you know. You ain't got to listen to nothing I say. But a guy named Neil Miller wrote a book in 2002 about vaccines. And he said vaccinations are neither safe nor effective. They don't prevent disease. They actually cause disease. And when I was in school, I remember getting a shot for measles. And I think there may be a couple more, but that was about it, about three shots. I got chicken pox in the sixth grade, and it was just something we were told that would eventually go away on its own, which it did. Now, we, you know, you, the bumps and stuff all over your body were very irritating. So, you know, you had a tendency to want to scratch them. You know, growing up, I always saying, don't scratch, don't scratch with it. You're not the one itching. But, you know, they would put cattle mine lotion or something on it. And I remember, I don't think I remember uh, getting another shot after elementary school until some years back. One of my dogs jumped up and 
bit me in the chest, took a hunk of meat out my chest on a Christmas day a few years back. And then I went to the ER and they, you know, I told them, I said, well, you know, she, she doesn't have rabies or anything. You know, she, she got kind of caught up on the fence and I was trying to get her loose. And, you know, I guess she was scared. So she bit me in the chest while I was trying to save her. And then I, they gave me a tetanus shot, but that's about it. You know, with, with the exception of all of them. Uh, IVs they put them on when I went in the hospital but chicken pox went away after about a week and now there's a shot for chicken pox a vaccination shot for chicken pox and for anyone who gets shingles it's been found out that they actually took the chicken pox shot so do you think with all of the shots our babies have to take now they're better off or do you think those vaccines are a major cause of the health issues our kids are not having to battle? The system gave us Medicare and Medicaid. And these two things control two segments of society, the elderly and the young. So they turned around and gave us Obamacare a few years ago to, so, so that government would have full control of our health from birth to death. I will say this again. The plan is for there to be a single payer plan with the government as the administrator at every level. Have you listened to my last video yet? You may want to and do yourself a favor. Not because I'm any good, but the information is. I just shared it. Now, when we were taught about slavery in school, we were taught the horrors of the treatment of the slave with the whips and the beatings. Slaves are not allowed to own property. They were not allowed to marry unless they received permission from slave bosses. They were forced to breed and create more slaves for the system. And what, what we don't hear too much of, we don't hear about all the other stuff that came along with slavery. We hear about a few of them, but we don't, we don't hear about the laws that were on the books that said you could kill a slave with no legal repercussions. What are you seeing today with abortion, infanticide, which is legally killing babies who are born alive, and genocide, which is the killing of elderly, elderly. I mean, you know why. Because the people in control, to the people in, in control, you are their slave. And after you have outlived your perceived usefulness, in their minds, you have no right to leech off of society. I mean, you, we paying almost 50% in taxes to the government and we're supposed to try to manage off the other 50% the rest of our life. So who's the biggest leech? But they tell us we're, we're the ones leeching. I saw, you know, I remember a guy years ago said that old people are useless weeds and useless eaters of society. And, you know, they don't need to be kept around. And I saw a picture of him the other day being pushed in his wheelchair with his cane in his hand. And so... It wasn't just a slave boss that the law said could kill a slave. Anybody that was a free person could actually kill a slave if he or she was declared a runaway. And if they did, it would be as if the act never even happened. Like that person didn't even exist. Babies killed in and outside the womb are quickly forgotten. They never existed. Slave could also be dismembered. What do you think aborted baby parts and organ harvesting is doing? What do you think that is? Do you realize that as this country got more slaves back then, there were more laws placed on the books to control the slave? What does America look like right now from a legal standpoint? How many laws are on the books that we have to abide by it, but the people who create them don't have to abide by it. Do you realize that slaves could not gather and talk among themselves because slave bosses feared they would be developing plans to overthrow them or escape? Now, you know who they use to manage the slaves for? Black preachers. And the black preachers would listen in on the meetings and they would take the information and report back to the slave boss for them pig feet. And they would report what the plans were. 
Slaves also could not have weapons of any kind. What are your Democratic legislators constantly calling for with regards to the Second Amendment? They have been working for years to disarm all Americans, except their security detail and themselves. Do you know who is the biggest enemy of gun owners? Your current president elect, who has already stated that he wants to pass more legislation on gun owners. Now, why could he say he wanted to pass more legislation? Well, it's because in his 1994 crime bill, he included legislation on guns. And so I can say this about the Republican Party. That's about the only good thing they stand for is protecting the Second Amendment. Anything else, they're they useless too. And so without the Second Amendment, you are going to lose the First Amendment. Well, what's left of it at this point? Slaves could not buy liquor. They couldn't even walk with a cane. They couldn't make joyful noises. Did you hear about the people who recently got fines for singing? While all of these laws were placed on the books for slaves to abide by, another law was placed on the books for slaves who poisoned their masters. If a slave was found to have poisoned their master, that was an automatic death penalty. What are the FEMA camps we've been hearing about? <laughs> Laws were put on the books for vagrancy for slaves. Slaves cannot walk the street at all without being locked up or having a legitimate reason for being out. And going to look for work wasn't even considered a legitimate reason. What did a lot of these no good mayors around the country put in place? They wanted their police officers to enforce mandates if you were caught patronizing a place that was not deemed essential by the mayor. Hey, if a person is open for business, that business is essential for the business owner. It doesn't have to be essential for nobody else. Thankfully, some police officers grew a spine and they pushed back because I think they realized those laws could be enforced against their family members and eventually themselves as well. And see, back then during slavery, the crime for a slave was being black because many free blacks were actually capital and sold into bondage as well. And today, the crime for a slave is just being alive and using the resources that the elites say belong to them and them only. Y'all better do some research. You know, get from in front of them TVs, put your phone down or use your phone as an education device. Stop using your phones for entertainment only. Put something valuable in your head. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois said back in 1903 that almost every law and method was employed by the legislature to reduce the Negro to serfdom. And right today, look at how many laws have been put on the books that are basically reducing us to serfdom. Did you hear me mention feudalism earlier? That is what serfdom is. Black people were banned from every occupation with the exception of servant or former, being servants or formers unless they pay the tax. Well, pretty soon you may not be able to work in certain profession if you don't take the vaccine in two separate doses, which they said the first dose is probably gonna really mess you up. And uh, so you need the second dose to help you get over the first dose but they are not liable for anything that happens to you. And they said this, one doctor said the dose is gonna make you feel so bad that you won't even want to leave bed. Yeah, that sounds like something you wanna sign up for. And so 
Blacks, back then, blacks could not use water fountains that were earmarked for whites and vice versa. And since the virus is the hot topic right now, water fountains have been covered up practically everywhere you go because you can't take chance of transmitting the disease. Yeah. Okay. So now, no one can use a fountain regardless of what color you are. What about when they did allow blacks to attend white schools? They could see their classmates and teachers, but they couldn't sit with them. They could not eat lunch with their classmates because they had designated seating. Have you seen the kids who returned to school this school year? They cannot sit next to each other in class. They can't have lunch together at a table. I mean, they might share a table, but you know, the table has some lint to them, but they can't sit next to each other in a cafeteria. One of the roles of our legislators is supposed to be to correct wrongs. But how can your legislators correct wrongs when it's your legislators creating all the wrong in society? Now that I have shared this information with you and showed you the parallels, do you see the problem and where we're headed? Let me tell you a secret. Slavery against blacks was only a test to see if it would be possible. I'm not talking about the biblical aspect of it. I'm talking about the physical aspect of it. It was a test to see if it would be possible to enforce slavery on all of society because if blacks complied and say what you want to say, all the research is that blacks are the strongest people on earth. That's not me saying that. That's a lot of your scientists. And don't try to say what well, that scientist because you say your scientists are credible when they're talking about the disease. So your scientists got to be credible with this too. So Blacks are the strongest people on the planet. That's why other people didn't last long as slaves. That's why they died so young, because they couldn't handle the heat. They couldn't handle the work. And so they knew enforcing slavery on all of society, if black complied, would be a piece of cake. You see, as blacks, our rights are still limited. So it becomes hard for us to fight a lot of things because the system still treats us a certain way. Now, i tell you something. All of you better forget about that skin color and realize that all of us serfs or proletariats are in this thing together. Have you seen the current food lines at the food banks? Why do we have mass food lines today? In this highly civilized society, we have thousands of people in food lines in order to feed their families. We hadn't seen that since the early part of the 20th century. And here we are a hundred years later, replaying everything that's going on. It's amazing we had the Great Depression that was actually artificially created in 1929. And we have something called Agenda 2030. <laughs> I mean, study your history, look at depressions, see how often they happen, when they happen, see how often recessions happen. And I mean, and then if you don't get sick, I don't know what to say about you. But we have thousands of people in food lines. Have you ever read Genesis 47? Or did you just glance at it and pass and by flipping pages in your Bible? Remember, how many of you remember when television used to go off at night? The TV would cut off. I mean, we have 24-7 television today. But, uh, Back then, when I was a kid, the television would cut off at night because cable TV wasn't even a thing as far as I knew. I think I might have been around middle school when some a company called Store a Cable. Um, they had got Store a Cable in the house. And you had a box that sat on the TV and you had a little thing you would slide across to switch channels. But your television would come on and the rainbow colored lines would come on the screen and emergency, it called it the emergency broadcasting system and it would tell you, this is a test. Well, folks, like it or not, 
This is not a test. This is real life we're dealing with. And you better wake the hell up. <laughs>